Okay, it's five past. Um, so I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, before we start real quick for the Vanderbilt folks uh, who are on, uh, we do offer CME credits. I will be uh, writing the CME code in the <laughs> chat because uh, Lindsay's not able to be with us. So I will write that in shortly, but again, that's just for our Vanderbilt folks. Um, uh, today, uh, it is a pleasure for me to introduce our one of our second year fellows, uh, Sagar Patel. He's going to be presenting to us on this paper that was comparing home hemodialysis to peritoneal dialysis patients. Uh, Sagar uh, did his medical training at the Medical College of Georgia at Augusta University for both medical school and residency before joining us here at Vanderbilt for his nephrology fellowship. Uh, also a treat today to have with us one of the authors of the paper, Dr. Eric Weinhandel, who's joining us all the way from California. Happy to have you on board. And, you know, hopefully this is part of a trend that we have, you know, at least one of the authors of a paper with us uh, on call. And, you know, Eric promised that you'd be a permanent resident now of our journal club. <laughs> no pressure, Eric. Oh, well, well, I still live in Minnesota, so the central time is super convenient for me. Oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. But without further ado, Sagar, take it away. All right, can y'all hear me okay? All yep. right, thank you for the introduction, Dr. al -Shami. Uh, Thank you for everyone for coming here and Dr. Weinheindl for taking the time as well. Um, today, we're gonna be talking about home hemodialysis versus peritoneal dialysis. I'll be discussing various articles and uh, in regards to outcomes such as mortality, uh, hospitalizations, technique survival, we'll be looking at uh, in different countries versus the US. Um, but the reason why I chose this topic is we've been pushing a lot uh, for home dialysis modalities over in center. Um, I think at, at this point, it's well known that patients doing home modalities have better outcomes, uh, better for the patient in regards to quality of life, uh, from an economic standpoint, there's benefits. And also from a mortality uh, standpoint, there's many uh, articles out there that show this, suggest this data. However, within the home modality choices, we have home hemo versus peritoneal. There hasn't been quite as much comparing the two head to head. And I do wanna preface this by saying the objective of our talk today, it's not for you to leave here saying that one modality is better than the other modality. I don't want to give off that impression. I, what I do want is to present some information uh, that we can all use uh, in a holistic approach, taking into account as well the patient, their needs, and uh, making a joint decision to see you know, what modality fits each individual patient the best. Um, I want to start off by, uh, we're going to be talking briefly, just comparing home modalities to in-center. Um, that could be a whole topic on its own. Uh, then we're going to talk about a few studies uh, from other countries, and then I'll bring it home to the U.S., uh, and we'll be going over Dr. Weinhandel's uh, article. Uh, I do not have any disclosures. Uh, first article we're going to briefly talk about is uh, comparing mortality of peritoneal uh, dialysis and hemodialysis patients. Um, this article looking at within the first two years of dialysis therapy uh, published in uh, 2013 in the Clinical uh, Journal of American uh, Society of Nephrology. Um, just briefly, this is a retrospective cohort study, included 22,000 hemodialysis patients, 1,300 peritoneal dialysis patients who initiated between July 1st, 2001 and June 30th, 2004. They looked at the two-year mortality, um, and as you can see, the top line representing peritoneal dialysis survival and the bottom line representing hemodialysis survival in center. Um, there was a 48% lower mortality in peritoneal dialysis compared to hemodialysis with a hazard ratio of 0.52. This was statistically significant. Um, so that's just one of many articles that suggest the mortality benefit of uh, PD compared to hemo. Uh, 
Uh, this next briefly, we'll talk about uh, home hemo versus in-center hemo thrice weekly. Um, the study from 2012, again, by Dr. Weinheimel um, in the Journal of American Society of Nephrology. Um, this is a retrospective cohort study, uh, looked at 1,873 home hemo patients compared to 9,365 in-center patients from 2005 to 2008. Uh, the cumulative survival for the home hemo patients was 71.7% as compared to 67.6% .6 in the in-center uh, dialysis patients. You can see on this Kaplan-Meier curve, there is some separation, um, but just wanted to confirm with the numbers that there, there is a 13% lower risk of all-cause mortality with a hazard ratio of 0.87 and a confidence interval spanning 0.78 to 0.97. Thus, this is a statistically significant uh, mortality benefit in home hemo versus in-center hemodialysis. Um, so now that we've kind of established in-center over, uh, or home modality over in-center, um, want to look at comparing home hemo and peritoneal dialysis. Um, the first large such study um, was done out uh, in Australia and New Zealand. Um, this article titled in inc Incident Cohort Study Comparing Survival on Home Hemodialysis and Peritoneal Dialysis uh, was published in 2015 um, in the Journal of American Nephrology. This was a retrospective cohort study. Um, the data was obtained from the Australia and New Zealand Dialysis and Transplantation Registry Study. This study kind of assesses all Australian and New Zealand adult patients that receive home dialysis, um, uh, looking at specifically patients that were on a home modality at day 90 after initiating uh, renal replacement therapy. So some people get started off on in-center, but if you were on a modality by day 90, you were included in the study, looking at patients from 2000 to 2012. Um, it included a large number of peritoneal patients, 10,710, as well as 706 uh, home hemo patients. The primary outcome that they looked at was uh, overall survival at five years. And they also looked at multiple secondary outcomes, um, those being on treatment survival, patient and technique survival, and death centered survival. The uh, on treatment survival uh, was defined as any death occurring within uh, while you're on your home modality or up to 90 days of being switched to a different modality. So if you were on peritoneal dialysis and there was an issue and you had to get switched to in-center and you died 50 days later, you are still included in the study. But if you passed away 100 days later, we're going to attribute that more towards the in-center and take you out of the study. Um, with regards to tech, uh, technique failure was defined as uh, more than 90 days of, of being in, uh, in cent on in-center uh, hemodialysis. Um, the composite patient and technique survival assessment, uh, patients were followed until they either had technique failure or death. And then for the death-centered technique survival, they looked at only technique failure as the endpoint um, and did not look at death. So, looking at the results of this study, um, this is a Kaplan Meier curve showing the overall survival, the dark line on top being home hemodialysis and the dotted line representing peritoneal dialysis. Um, and it did show that treatment with home hemodialysis was associated with a better patient survival. Then treatment with peritoneal dialysis, the five-year survival was 85% compared to 44% and had a hazard ratio of 0.47 um, that was statistically significant. And these graphs all kind of look the same. Um, they do represent the different <coughs> secondary outcomes. Uh, graph A is looking at on-treatment survival. Um, Again, this has a hazard ratio of 0.34, that is statistically significant. Uh, chart B is looking at the composite patient and technique survival, again, statistically significant. And uh, chart C is looking at dead center technique survival. So it seems like 
this is pretty large study and at least within what they're doing in Australia and New Zealand, there does seem to be a both mortality benefit and patients are sticking with their particular home modality longer um, when they're on home hemodialysis as compared to peritoneal dialysis. Sagar, uh, it's Tom Gulper. On this, uh, refresh me, what happened if they dropped out during training? Is that is that uh, considered part of the analysis because of intention to treat or was it only after they went home? Do you know? Uh, do not know specifically about that. Um, Let me tell you why that's relevant. Because in uh, uh, New Zealand, and I don't know what fraction of these patients were Australian or New Zealand, but in New Zealand, home training in hemo is six months. And, and uh, I mean, you, you got to think about that for a second. I mean, if you're going to put up with six months of home training, then you're, you're one tough cookie. And, and that's why that's relevant. You want to be very careful with New Zealand. I can't speak for Australia, but Mark Marshall trained with me many years ago, and he's one of the mavens in uh, New Zealand uh, dialysis. And, and I, I know that that is the case in New Zealand for sure. That's a very good point. Um you know, to specify, uh, you know, when do you count somebody as being on home hemodialysis? Is it the day one when they are independent of themselves or do you include that entire training period? Well, it's not that it's not just that because I can take six months and move these curves. It's it's survival of the fittest in, during the training period. That's what I'm getting at. Uh, so unfortunately, I did not see anything specifically about uh, that here. And I, I do see how, uh, like you mentioned, that could alter uh, the curves that we're seeing here. And it reinforces what Eric has done in the study that you're going to report on in just a minute with the matching. I mean, you do your best to match it. That, but that's not what was done in uh, the, the uh, Annie Claire study, which is this one. Um, next, we're going to fly north of the border over to Canada. Um, this is a study by Trin et al, uh, a comparison of technique survival in Canadian peritoneal dialysis and home hemodialysis patients. Uh, this was published in 2019 in the Journal of Nephrology and Dialysis Transplant. Um, this study was a registry study okay. design. So this was a registry-based cohort study um, looking at adult patients who initiated PD or home hemodialysis within a year of starting renal replacement therapy, um, looking at patients between 1st of January of 2000 to December of 2012. Um, the end of the observation period was December 31st, 2013. Um, this study it did specifically mention that PD patients included patients who were on CAPD or APD. And they also did specify that home hemodialysis uh, included people on conventional three times a week at home versus short daily versus nocturnal dialysis. Um, the study included 14,461 PD patients and 853 home hemo patients. Uh, these patients were taken from the Canadian Organ Replacement Register uh, which is a validated national registry that captures all the incidents, prevalence, and outcomes of over 99% of the chronic dialysis patients and transplant patients in Canada. The uh, primary outcome they looked at was technique failure as defined by a transfer to an alternative dialysis modality for more than 60 days. And the secondary analysis that they did were looking at uh, comparisons of technique, fa technique failure amongst different pre-specified patient subgroups and they also looked at uh, the rates of the um, failure with regards to their timing. So with regards to technique survival, um, the graph on the left shows the accrued technique failure rates. Um, so you can see the uh, uh, at year one, there was not as much difference, but then after that, there's definitely um, benefit uh, or superiority in the home hemo group. Uh, on the graph on the right, it's showing both the adjusted and the unadjusted um, data. If we look at overall, 
um, we do see uh, that uh, there were uh, hazard ratio was lower for technique failure in the home hemo group compared to the peritoneal group uh, with a hazard ratio of 0.79. Uh, um, it is statistically significant. Again, at year one, there was no difference, uh, but after that is when the um, difference started to emerge. Uh, next slide. Um, so for the subgroup analyses, um, this is looking at the hazard ratios again. Um, in the you know patients under 64, um, there seemed to be the same benefit. Uh, patients over 65, for some reason, there was no uh, significant difference. Also, kind of what part of the study they were, were included. So patients that were started from 2000 to 2008, um, they saw the same. Uh, can you go back one? Uh, but there was no difference in the groups from 2009 to 2012. Um, here's what I, I especially enjoyed was the, they did specify and uh, look at patients with a catheter um, when they're doing their home hemodialysis versus those with a graft or a fistula. I think this is very important data to extrapolate when you're talking about hemodialysis, home hemodialysis because, you know, to lump it all into one category um, does it, uh, not, doesn't do you much justice because those with the catheter uh, will tend to have poor outcomes uh, just with their risks of infection being that much higher. And additionally, the, the type of dialysis you're doing or the, your dosing should also be uh, addressed. And they, they did look at that here, that when they did conventional three times a week, they didn't notice much difference. But when they looked at the short daily dialysis versus slow nocturnal, that there were better outcomes in the home hemo uh, subgroup. Um, next. Um, this next uh, chart is just showing the uh, rates of uh, technique failure with regards to uh, timing of it. So it does look like within the first three day, uh, 30 days, um, there was a uh, high, the highest incidence of uh, technique failure in, in both the PD and the home hemo groups, and then the subsequent drop off. Uh, in the rate of events um, as time went on. And then you can see for, you know, any specific point of time, there was a higher number of events in the peritoneal group as compared to the home hemo group. Um, so next we're gonna talk about um, a study here in the US uh, looking specifically at mortality. Um, in home hemo versus peritoneal dialysis. This is by Choi et al., uh, published in 2020 in the American Journal of Nephrology. Uh, this was a retrospective um, cohort study uh, examining patients uh, from uh, or ESRD uh, across various uh, large uh, center uh, or large facilities of dialysis in the U.S. They recruited from uh, January 1st, 2007 to December 31st, 2011, included uh, over 16,000 patients on peritoneal dialysis and 19, uh, 1,993 patients on home hemodialysis. Uh, the primary outcome that they looked at was mortality, uh, but this study differed in the previous two in that uh, the, uh, the first two, the previous two studies, if you remember, they specifically looked at patients who started their home dialysis therapy within a certain amount of time of starting uh, their renal replacement therapy overall. This study looked at all patients, regardless of when they initiated their home dialysis therapy, but then they did do a subgroup analysis looking at if they started their home modality within three months of starting dialysis. Uh, between three to 12 months or after 12 months of initiating their dialysis. Um, so here we're looking at the crude rates of uh, mortality uh, amongst uh, home hemo patients compared to PD patients. Uh, as we can see, 9.6 um, rate per 100 person years in the home hemo group as compared to 12.9 with a statistically significant um, outcome. And we can go to the next slide. Um, so here, 
uh, we kind of see when we subdivided into those three groups with graph A representing those who initiated home dialysis therapy within three months of starting their dialysis therapy, graph B representing those three to 12 months and graph C representing those who started their, dial their home dialysis uh, more than 12 months after uh, starting dial uh, their renal replacement therapy. Uh, the first graph, um, you can see it, they're pretty in line with each other. There is no statistically significant difference. Uh, in graph B, you do start to see a little bit of separation. However, if you notice uh, the P log rank of 0.075, that, that little bit of difference is not statistically significant. But then clearly in graph C, those who um, started their home modality 12, year, 12 months after uh, starting dialysis, that there is clearly um, a mortality benefit in those on home hemodialysis as compared to those on peritoneal dialysis. Um, next slide. Um, and this is just kind of showing the same thing. They did a few other adjustment models, um, but Kind of overall, for the most part, you're seeing that in the greater than six months group, uh, we are seeing statistically significant difference that favors home hemo, whereas uh, in the other subgroups, there was no significant difference. So that brings us to the main article that I wanted to talk about today um, by Dr. Juan Handel, um, mortality, hospitalization, and technique failure in home in dialysis uh, daily home hemodialysis and matched peritoneal dialysis patients. This is a matched cohort study uh, published in the American Journal of Kidney Disease in 2016. This was the largest such study uh, in regards to how many home hemodialysis patients they recruited. Uh, next slide. So like we said before, this is a matched cohort study, meaning uh, what they did is they took for every one home hemodialysis patient, they match them to another peritoneal dialysis patient. Um, looking at patients who uh, were initiated on home hemo between January 1st of 2007 to December 31st of 2010, or peritoneal patients who were initiated on uh, October 1st, 2006 to uh, September of 2010. This data was obtained from the United States uh, Renal Database uh, serve, uh, System. Uh, a whopping 4,201 home hemo patients and 4,201 peritoneal dialysis patients. If you recall the previous studies, the most home hemo patients in any of those other studies uh, was less than 2,000. It was 1,900 and something, I believe. Uh, this study looked at three main outcomes, rel uh, relative mortality, hospitalizations, and technique failure. And they did do subgroup analyses of uh, cause of mortality and causes of hospitalizations. And the uh, uh, follow-up period um, was looked at in two different rules. Um, one is the intention to treat rule, uh, where they followed up patients um, from when they started on renal replacement therapy uh, until either death, loss of Medicare coverage, or the end point of the study being December 31st, 2010. For the on-treatment rule, um, they added on uh, an end date uh, when a patient received a kidney transplant or on the final day of uh, a two-month interval under, under, uninterrupted being on in-center hemo. So meaning uh, they're on switched to hemodialysis for some other reason uh, for two months. And so they cut you off there that you're no longer part of the study. Uh, next slide. Um, so how did they gather these patients? Uh, so they started with the home, hemo, gathering all the home hemo patients first before matching them each to the peritoneal patients. Uh, so in order to do that, they used the uh, next stage system one uh, user base Next stage being the largest uh, home hemo uh, uh, provider of home hemo uh, machines out there in the US currently. So that gave them a large uh, group to work with, over 8,000 patients. They then uh, sub, uh, took out anyone that was not part of the US RDS. Uh, then they uh, looked at patients that were initiated within the window uh, that we were looking at so that they were not initiated any later than. Uh, June 30th of 2010, uh, they were able to see kind of 
a little bit about the prescription the patients were receiving. So wanted to be on five or six days a week of dialysis. And then uh, wanted to stratify these patients uh, into three different strata to kind of do a subgroup analysis as well. Um, that being uh, patients who were um, started on uh, their home modality less than six months from when they started dialysis, as well as um, having Medicare uh, during the three months preceding the date of home uh, dialysis initiation. They also looked at um, patients uh, who were um, ESRD less than six months, uh, sorry, who initiated a home hemo less than six months from initiating dialysis, who were without Medicare three months prior to initiating home hemotherapy or home dialysis therapy. And they looked at patients who were started on uh, home modalities six months, uh, at least six months um, after starting their um, renal replacement therapy. Uh, next slide. So this is a, probably a little bit hard to read. There's a, a lot on here, but this is uh, when they were looking at matching the home hemo patients to peritoneal patients using a propensity score um, within each stratum. So uh, you may not be able to see it, but take my word for it. Within each stratum, meaning the, you know, the dialysis patients, uh, that were on uh, home modality more than six months, uh, started on home modality more than six months after starting dialysis, those less than six months who were not with Medicare, and then those less than six months who were, who were with Medicare. Within a particular stratum, these patients were matched, you know, accordingly, pretty equally with regards to age, race, uh, gender, uh, cause of their ESRD being diabetes, hypertension, GNs, uh, other comorbidities that they may have had. Um, so within each stratum, they were uh, fairly well matched. Um, between two different stratums, there were some differences um, to take into account. Uh, next slide. Um, so this uh, graph here is showing um, primary outcome of mortality. Um, this is in the intention to treat analysis. Graph uh, A is looking at all the patients, and we can see there is a split in this Kaplan-Meier curve that shows um, a higher mortality in peritoneal patients compared to home hemo patients. Uh, graph B is showing the subgroup or the strata with uh, patients who were initiated on uh, a home modality within six months of starting renal replacement therapy. So if you were started on your therapy earlier, it looks like there was no significant difference. Uh, and the next slide, this is again, kind of showing the similar things. This is instead of the intention to treat, this is the on-treatment analysis. But again, uh, in the overall, we do see that separation, the uh, mortality benefit in home hemo over peritoneal but in patients started within six, who were started on home modality within six months of starting their renal replacement therapy, there was no significant difference between the two groups. Uh, next slide. Um, so now looking at kind of subdividing even further, what uh, causes of mortality, were there any difference amongst them? So as far as all cause mortality, uh, patients on home hemo had a uh, relative risk of 0.8, uh, statistically significant less than uh, uh, when compared to peritoneal patients. Looking at uh, cardiovascular disease, infection, and cachexia or dialysis withdrawal within the intention to treat group that looked at all patients, there was statistical significance amongst literally every single uh, group. Um, and also in year one and year two, uh, year three, four, they did not see a significant difference. Um, and then if you look on the right side of the chart and look at those patients who initiated home dialysis less than six months from starting renal replacement therapy, there is absolutely no significant difference in any of these subgroups. So again, we're seeing that, you know, something about starting within six months, starting early, uh, seems to kind of 
narrow the curve between home hemo and peritoneal dialysis. Um, and that's all within the intention to treat group. The on treatment group, uh, I won't go through all of them. It's, it's essentially fairly similar that, you know, all of the causes of mortality, there's benefit when we look at all patients, but when we look at those that initiated within the first six months, there is no uh, difference. What was the average initiation time for like the overall cohort? Um, I am not sure about that. Eric, do you, do you know uh, it's, on the, it's on the table on the previous slide. There's oh, a okay. ESRD duration field that is kind of in the middle. Well, not previous slide, yeah, that one. <laughs> ESRD duration, uh, about a fourth of the way down the table. And so that's enumerated in months uh, between date of uh, ESRD and date of home dialysis initiation. Okay, so yeah, 64.6, 64.9. Okay, so quite a quite a big spread, right? When you compare the less than six months to the rest, right? So because that's five years yep. over five years, then. Yep. Okay, that's, yeah, that's yeah. I mean, very typical for HHD in this era. Obviously, uh, you should get your wheels turning about what that means for PD. <laughs> yeah. Very unusual, right? Yeah. Well, that, that's unusual in the national average. I agree with you, Eric. If you look at our uh, home hemo program, uh, those are those tend to be incident patients. You, but uh, uh, you're absolutely correct, and you know it as well as I do that uh, uh, the majority of people on home hemo have been on in center first. But but at the Vanderbilt program, that's actually the other way around. They. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's a that's the thing that's kind of been in flux. There's definitely more just nationally. There's more incident patients finding their way to HHD than there were ten years ago. Um, but I agree. Uh, the the <laughs> how should I say it? Centers that have, are relatively high volume HHD centers tend to have more incident patients on therapy. Mm -hmm. um, next, we're going to be looking at the hospitalizations uh, as the outcome. Um, here we can see that. You know, again, in the all patient group, there was statistically uh, significant reduced uh, relative risk uh, for home hemo patients compared to peritoneal patients for all cause hospitalization. Um, seen in uh, hospitalization for cardiovascular disease, for infection, but not for dialysis access dysfunction. Although, um, if you look a little bit further down in the hospital days, uh, there was, even, even though they had similar rates of hospitalizations for dialysis dysfunction, access dysfunction, those on home hemo had much lower uh, hospital length stays. Um, and now comparing that to, on the right side of the chart, uh, patients who initiated home modality within six months of renal replacement therapy, uh, as far as hospitalizations are concerned, there was no significant difference overall, even when looking at cardiovascular versus infection versus access uh, dysfunction. Um, maybe a small benefit in uh, length of stay for cardiovascular, um, but essentially uh, not much difference there at all. Uh, slides. Um, and then looking at the specific causes of cardiovascular disease and infection, um, you can see arrhythmia didn't really play a key role for ischemic heart disease, but as far as um, admissions for cerebrovascular disease, heart failure, hypertensive disease, and peripheral arterial disease, we do see uh, you know, significant uh, less rates uh, amongst home hemo patients as compared to uh, peritoneal patients uh, that did exist in both the uh, intention to treat and the on treatment group. As far as infections, um, here we see that uh, as far as bacteremia and sepsis, there was statistically significant increase um, in homo, uh, home hemo patients compared to peritoneal patients, as well as cardiac infection. Um, however, when we look at dialysis access infection, it's uh, including peritonitis, it is much less, um, you know, home hemo patients, they're accessing their blood, it's hemodialysis. So it seems reasonable that you would have higher bacteremia and bacteremia could spread to cardiac. Um, but 
that the overall infectious rate was lower in home hemo as compared to peritoneal. Um, just specifically bacteremia and cardiac infection were higher. Uh, next slide. Um, so now last thing we're gonna look at is technique failure. Um, technique failure was defined uh, by the conversion to in-center hemodialysis for at least two months. Um, here we're looking at the cumulative incidence of uh, technique failure, uh, chart A being uh, looking at all patients and chart B being looking at the subset of patients who initiated home modality within six months of starting renal replacement therapy. Um, you can see some clear separation in both these Kaplan-Meier curves, um, but to look more specifically at the data itself, um, for chart A, we had a um, hazard ratio of 0.63 uh, with a in confidence interval between 0.58 and 0.68. So this was a significant uh, difference. And then in the um, chart B, um, hazard ratio was 0.7 with a confidence interval between 0.6 and 0.82. So this one also was statistically significant. Um, so that starting within six months uh, did not seem to um, close the gap as it did in when we were looking at infectious risk, uh, uh, hospitalizations, and mortality. Um, so that's kind of my assessment, you know, presenting the data to you all. Um, as far as this, this study itself, I, I this one wanted to open it up to the crowd, um, starting first with the fellows, and then I'll kind of give some of my thoughts as well, and then I'll open it up to the rest of the audience uh, as well. Um, but, you know, some of the fellows in the room, what are some of the strengths you, you saw in this study? We had a large cohort, so um, a good sample size compared with some of the other studies, previous studies. Yeah, definitely the, the sample size, uh, seeing 4,200 home hemo patients in a study is, is a lot. You know, all the other studies, they may have, they're comparing peritoneal to home hemo, but they're looking at, you know, thousands of peritoneal patients and only hundreds of home hemo patients. So that, this was, uh, you know, more than twice as big as any of the other studies I saw with regards to home hemo patients. Um, the other strength I think they did was, you know, matching the patients, um, the home hemo patients to the peritoneal patients. You know, there's, Inevitably, going to be a lot of uh, confounding variables. Uh, this was a, um, you know, it's not a prospective study. This is looking back, retrospective, um, observational study. So we can't get uh, everything, but trying to match them is going to get us the best data we can. Um, any weaknesses that y'all jumped out at y'all? I think the uh, maybe the technique failure is a can be a confounder to uh, why mortality is higher for PD like three years out. Like if you look at the first three years, you know PD and HD are, or home HD are pretty comparable mortality, and they have lower uh, technique failure. But as PD patients have more technique failures, you know after three, four years, five years, then you see the mortality difference as well. Yeah. Um, and some of the other things that uh, I was looking at, you know, when they selected the home hemo patients, they used the next stage um, registry. Um, but there is some inevitable bias that you're using only next stage and not any of the other uh, companies. Um, and then also, you know, like the, the Canadian study, what I really enjoyed about that is they looked at specifically, um, you know, what uh, type of modality for the peritoneal versus, like, you know, was it uh, ambulatory versus cycler? And then for the home hemo, they also subdivided into, uh, you know, what kind of access do they have, catheter versus graft fistula, um, what the what prescription uh, or at least their frequency of dialysis was. Um, and here we didn't quite get as much of a sense of that. Uh, they used uh, uh, more diagnosis coding, especially when looking at the hospitalizations. And so you don't get as specific about those, you know, you say infection or, you know, dialysis related infection, but to 
go back and say, you know, specifically, this is, these are people who had catheter related issues versus, you know, did the fistula and graft people, if you split those two groups apart, would you see a different um, uh, benefit? Um, some of the other, you know, you know, how do we interpret this data? Um, so I think before, before we move on real quick, um, Dr. Weinhandel, um, what, what is your take on some of these strengths and weaknesses of your study and anything that, uh, you know, having firsthand knowledge of the study, of course, and having written it up, anything that, that you think could have been done differently or some, some information that you would have wanted that you weren't able to get access to? Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the data you don't have access to is probably the most glaring thing. I mean, the um, at the time, back in whatever this was, you know, 2005 to 2010 USRDS data, let's call it, um, identifying HHD, especially if you're trying to get to specific dates, like, for instance, this issue of first day of training versus first day at home was basically impossible. Um, and so next stages registry was entirely critical uh, to the execution of this study because it provided resolution with, you know, first date of the patient starts training, the date was no one. Um, and then the first date that they call it the uh, first day at home or something. But uh, anyway, you know that date. And so you've got, you've got specificity around calendar times and you can well define the beginning of follow-up. Um, you know, in addition, you at least knew what the prescribed treatment frequency was at the time, four times a week was sort of the aberration. There wasn't a lot of it because this was before the system one S. Um, and so the, the max flow rate was 200. And so almost everybody was on five or six, um, you know, and, and so trying to get this cohort to a more homogeneous kind of group of regular prescriptions that, you know, maybe four times a week at that time would have been supplemented by residual function more likely or would have been reserved for very small people. Uh, it's different now, obviously. Um, and so there's some more, more four and five times a week. So anyway, the next stage data was really critical to executing the study. Um, that said, it's a very simple kind of um, customer database because what next stage was trying to do was collect enough data to ship supplies to people. It wasn't designed to be a clinical registry. Um, and so you've got that merged with USRDS. And now you're in USRDS land and you're missing all sorts of things. I mentioned in the chat, residual function is unknown. So that certainly tempers what you can know about PD um, and all sorts of details about why patients discontinue home dialysis are unknown. I mean, you can attempt to see whether somebody's been hospitalized or not, but it's nothing like a dialysis provider's EHR data that says, you know, here's the documented reason according to the home center about why the patient discontinued home therapies. So leaves a lot to be desired. That said, I guess the plus side is the hospitalization data, despite its warts when you're in Medicare claims, um, is probably better in terms of the richness of the things that were going on in the hospital than you would ever get out of a provider's EHR data where you've got, depending on the company, all sorts of holes and problems. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, it's got pluses and minuses, like most studies. Eric, do you have a, a sense of center size uh, with regards to the home hemo? Uh, because in, mm -hmm. if, if it's just any comers in PD, I, there's an awful lot of tiny centers, but at yeah. least for home hemo using next stage, you might have had some uh, centers, an example being my Krause's center that mm -hmm. has a lot, or Joel Glickman center, or yeah. things like that. Was there a center effect, or could you even tell? We didn't make any attempt to look at that at the time. Um, trying to remember, I suspect that the data use agreement with USRDS was in an earlier generation where that was pretty highly discouraged. Um, and so I don't ever remember looking at that really until I got to next stage as an employee and I started doing more center level analyses. Um, it certainly was true that in that era, there were some uh, HHD super centers, um, you know, and, and aside from the ones that you just listed, um, DCIs, Ruben, well, it was Ruben facilities independent of DCIs, this was long before the acquisition, but that was uh, the Clifton Park Saratoga centers were huge. Um, and you know that, I mean, that speaks to a big picture issue, which is hard to communicate, um, maybe only in the value of, you know, hindsight. Um, it's tempting to look at these studies, right, and always say, well, this is a modality compared to another modality. But the more you observe of how home dialysis is done, you realize that all of this stuff is wildly confounded by center level practices and center level aptitude. And the context matters so much, right? And so... You know, I, I, I would say <laughs> these are interesting observational studies, um, but they're nothing like comparing one drug with known pharmacodynamics to another drug like you get in an RCT. It's never at all like that. <laughs> 
Um, thank you. And I'll, I'll you know, give one talk a little bit about how can we interpret this data, um, you know, data that suggests that uh, patients who initiated on home dialysis after 12 months, that there is a, a benefit of more of being on home hemo as compared to peritoneal. But when you start within that first 12 months, that it, it goes away. So why, why are we seeing this? What is causing that benefit? Uh, some, you know, the thoughts I, were, I was thinking, you know, the patient, PD patients, are they more reliant on their residual kidney function? And, you know, by starting early on, do they do better than patients who are on, they're on in-center hemodialysis for a year, they start to lose some of the residual kidney function, and then they start PD. And that's why that possibly why we're seeing those changes in the outcome. Um, other things to consider are that are, is there an inherent selection bias uh, in our home hemo patients? You know, are these patients to be a home hemo, are they in better social situation with better support system? Are they generally healthier or, you know, able to make their appointments better? Um, I know we did the matching already, um, but just kind of other things to, to consider. And then lastly, you know, Again, I'm coming back to the, for home hemo, what kind of access do you have? You know, when you initiate, is, you know, if this kind of happened more urgently than you thought, maybe that graft or fistula, it's not ready or it's not in place, and you start off with a catheter. And, you know, for that first year, you don't see as much of the benefit, but those people who, you know, have, you know, they get that fistula, that graft, and now all of a sudden, you don't have the risks of having the catheter, your mortality, your hospitalizations start to decrease. Um, someone, anybody else have any thoughts on, on those? Well, in that same vein, uh, Sagar, that if you start PD four years after you've been on dialysis, it, the likelihood is not that you just made a, 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 a choice. It, it's likely that a choice was made for you because of something like running out of accesses. And yeah. so uh, that's that's always a danger. And so I, I forget what that's called. Eric, Roger, Osama, you guys can help me or carry with what that's called. It's, it's not competing risk. It's something else. When when the, the duration of your therapy increases your risk for something else happening, uh, I, I for, for outcome, it's called competing risk. But what's it called uh, in just the, the thought process of what's going on? Bad data. <laughs> <laughs> That's reasonable. I mean, I call it confounding from an epi perspective. I, it, what it is, is that we don't have an understanding of how many of these patients who are on PD five years in um, are, are just, like you said, literally out of access placements and their vasculature is highly deteriorated. And, you know, if I could do it all over again, the patients who initiated within the first six months would be the primary analysis and the broader cohort would be the secondary analysis. But it's one of those things where <laughs> the value and, of hindsight. Eric, uh, uh, were you involved? I think Next Stage did a study on those that abandoned PD uh, and went straight to home hemo. Is that, is that your study? And uh, can you uh, comment on that? Abandoning PD, but staying on home therapy. Oh, you mean like conversions from PD to HHD directly? Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, yes. I had done that with uh, Jose Morphine and uh, Shrew Cancel, who's now at University Hospitals in Ohio. Um, yeah, we had looked at that. I mean, that's a, it's a, a very rare kind of outcome, <laughs> absolutely speaking. Um, you know, something like uh, of people who are discontinuing, maybe two to 3% of patients nationally are on the HHD within a short period of time like within a few weeks or a few months. Um, and that's not unusual. All countries around the world, I think, are like that. Um, you know, I don't, I, that, that is a whole different topic <laughs> for a different day. <laughs> well, but, but, but uh, it's a lesson to our fellows is that things can go wrong. And, and if a, a PD patient is not doing well, either socially or, for, or medically, you might want to consider getting a fistula in those patients fairly early, which now at least offers them the option of the best form of hemo, be that in center or otherwise, they have an access. But, but if they already have an access, that might steer them towards home hemo if they want to stay home. Yeah, I think that comes kind of back to the first thing that I mentioned before we started that, you know, this data, is it saying one's better than the other? Or we just need to put that in the grand scheme of things that, you know, for this particular patient, 
what is is the best decision and you know whether we see the benefit from home hemo over pd there are patients who pd like you said when you don't have any access pd is the choice that we're going to go with because it's going to be the most beneficial to them i just want to add so, um uh, a point that uh, Dr. Salani made in the chat. So she said, selection bias is not just physician bias, but patient bias as well. Some refuse HHD, even though they're not doing great on PD, but may have better outcomes compared to the patient doing great on PD. And I think that's an important point and something, you know, it's an inevitable thing that we're always going to see because it's hard, you know, there's only one of us and we can't have two lives to kind of see what, you know, how we would do on on the modalities, but uh, I think that's uh, that's a good point. And, and that's an important point, uh, uh, Mega and Osama, because that's why we've been strict about trying to have our home nurses trained in both PD and hemo. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there are programs that just have home hemo nurses and just uh, PD nurses. And if you can have your nurses trained in both, that can be very, very helpful just for the problem that uh, Mega brought up. Now, just in respect of time, because I know we are kind of out of time. Uh, now, any last thoughts from Sagar or any of our panelists here about the subject matter? We'll restrict it to like two minutes. I want to make a point. I mean, Tom's old like me. and We've seen these things come and go forever. Comparing, comparing, comparing PD to hemo, PD to home hemo, home hemo to regular hemo. And the problem is, is they're all flawed, and this, it, and it's very a risky test to do. It's a very risky analysis to do. This is well done, I think, and I, and I commend commend you. But I mean, because you can only do with what you have. But there will never be a randomized trial, perfectly randomized, to compare these two. Just the good news to me is that there's no gross uh, differences between, you know, gross differences between survival that would get somebody to not consider PD. Um, that's the, that's what I'm happy to see because that's the last thing we need is to have people avoiding it because of a, you know bad information. Yeah, I mean I agree. I, I, in fact, I would go so far as to say that not only do we not have an RCT, but that is sort of my point before is that actually I actually think that the principle of an RCT comparing two modalities, I'm not even sure that that's well founded if you really start to think deeply about it. Um, Maybe if you could do it within a single center where you isolated all the practice effects of the humans involved, but on a national or national basis, I don't even know what that would mean. Um, That's a really good point. Yeah. Well, so, there there is that the, the paper from China tried to do that. Asama, are we going to review that in Journal Club? That paper from China that you didn't like? Are you, or is that <laughs> no no no? Let, but but uh, the report in that in that paper it, it was a patient randomized. satisfaction study. Yeah. Okay, that's all they reported with patient satisfaction, not outcome. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah maybe maybe we'll uh, we'll put that next. We'll see the fellow who's on next and what their interests are, and we'll we'll we'll, we'll try to push that one. Oh uh, yeah. All right, so it's three past time. So in respect of everyone's time, I want to thank you all uh, for tuning in. Thank you so much, Dr. Weinhandel, for joining us today and your contribution to the discussion. Great paper. Um, and uh, thank you, Dr. Rabi, for always being here and joining us and everyone else who tuned in. I hope you learned something new. I know I do every time. And we'll see you all next month. OK, and thank you, Sagar, of course, for a great presentation. Good job, Eric.